The goal of the project in this video is to use for loops and if statements to create an upper triangular matrix. In the next slide, I'll show you what an upper triangular matrix is, and I'll show you the formula that you should use to populate the elements of this matrix. The bonus is to populate the lower triangle of the matrix to be the color inverted or the flipped version of the upper triangle. The key MATLAB skills exercised in this video are for loops, if statements, and initializing matrices using the zeros function. So here we have a upper triangular matrix. This is a square matrix. You can see this is the diagonal going down here. All the elements above and to the right of the diagonal are filled in with some information, some numbers. And all of the elements below and to the left of the diagonal are empty. These are all zeros. And here is the formula that you should use to create this matrix. So every element in this matrix, the ith row and the jth column, is equal to 1.03 to the power of the square root of the ith, so the row index, times the column index. Here's a little hint for creating an upper triangular matrix using for loops. The key insight is to think about the row index relative to the column index in the upper triangle versus the lower triangle. So here, these are the column indices over here, and this one happens to be 70 by 70. So let's say this point over here, this element of the matrix, this might be column, let's say, 65. Uh, but the row is actually very small. MATLAB starts counting rows at the top. So this element here might be row 10 and column 75. So what you should check is whether the row index is less than the column index. And if that's the case, if the row index is less than the column index, then you're currently looking at the upper triangular matrix. Here's the matrix you can create with the bonus exercise. And you can see that the lower triangle is now filled in, and it's set to be f the flipped version, the color inverted version of the upper part of the triangle. I'll give you a hint for creating this lower triangle, and if you don't want the hint, then you can mute the video now. The hint is you can still apply the same formula, except set this value to be negative, and on the left of this, you find the maximum possible value in this matrix. So what is the largest possible value in this entire matrix? And set the element of the lower triangle to be that maximum value minus this equation. Now let's switch to MATLAB and see if we can solve this problem together. Here is our partially filled in MATLAB code. This is gonna be a square matrix, so the number of rows is the same as the number of columns, so we only need to specify one dimension. Now we're going to initialize the matrix, and I'll initialize it using the zeros function. And again, because this is a square matrix, we only need one input. You can write this, but that's not necessary. Here we have a double loop, so it's a loop embedded within a loop. First we loop over the rows, and then we loop over the columns. I mentioned in the slides that we want to test whether each element, the element that we're currently working on, has a smaller row index than a column index. So we can accomplish that by saying if i is less than j. And now this if statement is incomplete, that's why MATLAB is complaining here. It wants a matching end, so I'll just fill in an end here. So now, if this statement is true, then we end up inside this loop. And now the question is, what do we do in here? What we do in here is apply the formula that I presented in the slides. So that was 1.03 to the power of the square root of i times j. And then this is the value of the element at the ith row and jth column in the matrix, so I'm going to write out mat i comma j equals this. So this seems right. I can look down here quickly and see if there's anything missing in the plotting code, but that seems to be okay. So I'll run this cell by pressing control enter, and here we go. This is our lovely upper triangular matrix, which looks very nice. 
Now this part is all zeros here. And now I'm going to go back and fill in the uh, lower triangle according to the instructions for the bonus exercise. So one way to solve this would be to have another if statement here that would say if i is uh, greater than j, and then we do something and then end that loop. But a slightly more elegant solution would be to embed this kind of a conditional into this statement. So what I'm going to do is say else. So now if this is true, then MATLAB will run this line. But if this is not true, which happens in two cases, either if i is greater than j or if i is equal to j, then MATLAB is going to skip to this line and will run whatever code I have between else and end. So I know that I'm still working on altmat i comma j. And I gave the hint in the video that this value has to be something minus uh, this value. And I said that it has to be the largest possible value in this matrix. So the question is, what is the largest possible value in this matrix given this formula? Well, this expression is maximized whenever this expression is maximized. And the largest i times j can ever be is when i and j are both equal to m, which is the, going to be the last element in the matrix. So that means the square, so what we should write here is 1.03 to the square root of m times m, which means the square root of m squared, which is actually just m. So here I'm going to write 1.03 to the power of m. And there you go. Actually, in the video, I had this uh, slightly differently. I had this presented in a separate subplot. And now let's think, how can we do this? There's no way to show only the upper triangle in the left plot and the full matrix in the right plot because I don't save these as separate variables. So in fact, by the time I get to the end of this loop, I don't have an upper triangular matrix anymore. So the only way to solve this bonus problem successfully and get an upper triangular matrix and a full matrix as two separate images is to have two matrices. So I'll say altmat2 equals zeros m. It's the same size. And now I can do this. And then here I can just copy and paste this plotting code and set this to be altmat2. However, when I run that code, that's not exactly the right thing because now this is only creating a lower triangular matrix. In fact, this title is wrong, so this should say eventually this is going to be a full matrix. So what we have to do, so there's a few solutions. One is I can also write this code here. So now I'm just assigning the output of this expression to both matrices. That's fine, but there's another interesting way to do this, which is to realize that these values are all zeros. And so if I add these two matrices together, nothing is going to change in the lower part of this triangular matrix because I'm only adding zeros to this part. And here in the upper triangle, I'm adding these relevant bits. So what I'm going to do instead is add those two matrices together. So I say altmat2 equals altmat plus altmat2. And now it works and we have successfully solved both the original exercise and the bonus problem. Thinking like this is particularly useful however much code you can get outside of these multiple embedded or nested command statements is going to save you a lot of time and avoid potential confusion. In this case, just having an extra line that implements the same formula redundantly for this other matrix, that doesn't take up a lot of computation time. But there will be other cases in real programming exercises or real problem solving situations in research and in industry where adding one more line might take an extra several hours to run this code, whereas doing something like this will only take a few milliseconds.